In the past few lessons, we've talked a lot about disc herniations and lower back pain. One concept that we have not really addressed to this point is that of radiating or referred pain. Often, when you treat a patient for a low back injury, they'll complain about a tightness or burning sensation in their posterior thigh. Well, why is that? Why would an injury in the region of the lower back result in pain down the legs? The answer lies in the compression of certain neural elements, and neural compression in specific regions can have highly predictable patterns of pain presentation. This is a concept that we'll explore in this session on spinal nerves and spinal cord segments. Welcome back. Hope you had a sufficient break because we are going to be discussing some rather challenging concepts in this third session. You want to be ready for it. We're going to be looking at the spinal nerves stemming off of the spinal cord, which are the main roads off the highway, and how certain types of neural injuries manifest in the body. In this session, we'll introduce a style of nomenclature similar to what we use for naming the vertebrae to identify the regions of the spinal cord and differentiate spinal nerves. We'll also take a closer look at macroscopic and microscopic anatomy to explore the principles behind the stretch reflex. These two concepts combined allow us to explore some pretty important clinical concepts, which we'll conclude this session with. We previously discussed the systematic naming system for the vertebrae. The very same system is applied to the spinal nerves and the spinal cord as well, based on the level of the intervertebral foramen that the nerve exits from. Consequently, we have eight pairs of cervical nerves identified by C1 through C8, 12 pairs of thoracic nerves labeled T1 through T12, and five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal branch, which follow a similar nomenclature. This doesn't create much of a problem for the thoracic region down, but if you think back to the lesson on the vertebral column, you'll hopefully recall that the cervical region had only seven vertebrae, not eight. The discrepancy comes from the fact that we have an extra cervical nerve branch that exits above the first cervical vertebrae. So here's how the numbering works. The first cervical nerve arising above C1 vertebrae is designated as C1 spinal nerve. The next six spinal nerves follow suit, each being named according to the cervical vertebrae they exit the intervertebral foramen above. So for example, the nerve exiting the intervertebral foramen between C4 and C5 vertebrae would be identified as the C5 spinal nerve. Beyond the C7 spinal nerve, things change. The nerve exiting between C7 and T1 vertebrae has been designated the C8 spinal nerve. The next nerve, exiting between T1 and T2, is the T1 spinal nerve. Note the change from the cervical region. We now label each spinal nerve according to the vertebrae that it exits below instead of above. This naming process continues for the remaining spinal nerve segments, each nerve being named for the vertebrae it exits below. So for example, the nerve exiting between T7 and T8 is the T7 spinal nerve, the nerve exiting between T12 and L1, the T12 spinal nerve, and the nerve exiting between L4 and L5, the L4 spinal nerve. This nomenclature comes in handy in clinical situations where diseases that impinge on the intervertebral canal, such as disc herniation or compression fractures, also impringe on the emerging nerve. It allows for an accurate prediction of the spinal nerve being impinged and the effects that this would have on the body. As you might imagine, based on this nomenclature, an impingement between C4 and C5 vertebrae would affect the C5 spinal nerve and affect peripheral nerve function to structures supplied by C5 spinal nerve. One of the most common examples of spinal nerve compression comes from lumbar disc herniation. As previously discussed in the lecture on the vertebral column, disc herniations tend to project posterolaterally, which places pressure on the nerves exiting the intervertebral foramen. As the image on the right indicates, these herniations are usually easily picked up on an MRI. Counting the vertebral number allows us to predict what intervertebral space will be compromised. Having now studied the spinal nerves, let's take a closer look at this nerve compression at different vertebral regions. Cervical disc herniations, for example, are fairly common. Here, we consider a disc herniation between C4 and C5. 
With the spinal cord in place, you should be able to appreciate that the nerve exiting between C4 and C5 will be compressed. Okay, so what happens with the C4, C5 herniation? Using our nomenclature from a couple of slides ago, you should recognize that this would be the C5 spinal nerve. Herniations in the thoracic region are not at all common because of how thin the discs are and the lack of motion here. But let's consider the case of T4-5 IV disc rupture just for clarity's sake. Once again, the nerve exiting this space is affected, but if you recall the change in nomenclature at this point, we are now looking at the T4 spinal nerve. Lumbar disc herniations are by far the most common, but also a little more tricky to accurately predict. Here we see the L4 nerve exiting between L4 and L5, as we would predict. Notice, however, that as part of the cauda equina, the L4 spinal nerve has been stretched inferiorly by the growth of the vertebral column, and therefore exits from the superior half of the intervertebral foramen, as pictured here. Here's where things get interesting. Notice that the disc herniation protrudes into the inferior half of the intervertebral foramen. So even though the L4 spinal nerve exits at this point, it's usually spared from compression. It's actually the L5 spinal nerve running obliquely through this region that is compressed, even though it exits a full level inferior to the site of herniation. This is the typical presentation for lumbar disc herniations. The nerve most likely to be compressed is the one that exits the intervertebral foramen one level below the site of injury. This is of great clinical importance as lumbar disc herniations are exceptionally commonplace. In a clinical setting, you may use diagnostic findings from MRI scans to make predictions regarding pain and loss of function or make a preliminary diagnosis of a patient presenting to your clinic with a specific set of findings. The nomenclature for naming the spinal nerves can be projected onto the spinal cord. Although the spinal cord is one continuous column, we can divide it into 31 theoretical segments based on the attachment points of each of the spinal nerves. To put it another way, imagine that the spinal cord is in an apartment complex with 31 separate stories. If a fire broke out in this apartment complex, the first thing that the fire department would want to know is what floor the fire is on. Similarly, in instances of spinal cord damage, the first thing the healthcare team is going to want to know is what specific region of the spinal cord was damaged. In the same way that we number the floors of a building, we can label the spinal cord according to which pair of spinal nerves attach to a given segment. To give you an example, if we trace the T10 spinal nerve back to the cord, its attachment site can be distinguished as the T10 spinal cord level. It's important to appreciate that while the spinal nerve segments line up precisely with their respective vertebral levels, at least at the point where they exit the vertebral canal, the spinal cord levels do not. This is a result of the growth discrepancy between the spinal cord and vertebral column that we discussed earlier. For example, the L3 spinal nerve exits under and is closely associated with the L3 vertebrae, as previously discussed. However, when we trace the L3 spinal nerve backwards and identify the L3 spinal cord level, it actually lies much further up in the vertebral column. This diagram depicts it as being around the T10 segment, but it's really closer to the T12 vertebrae. Physicians use the following rules for correlating palpable spinous processes to the underlying cord level. For spinous process C2 through C5, you can add 1 to the number to get the underlying spinal cord segment. So for example, if you were to palpate the C3 spinous process, your hand would be directly over the C4 spinal cord level. For spinous processes C6 through T6, you can add 2 to get the appropriate cord level. If you were to palpate the T4 spinous process, you would be directly over top of the T6 spinal cord segment. For spinous processes T7 through T10, three segments are added.
Now, unfortunately, this diagram doesn't do the best job for representing the lowest spinal cord segments, but spinous processes T11 and 12 should lie directly over all of the lumbar cord segments, and the first lumbar spine should be over all five sacral segments. This is of importance in understanding the consequences of spinal cord damage due to vertebral fractures. A radiograph demonstrating a fracture to the first lumbar arch does not translate into an L1 spinal cord lesion. Based on the aforementioned rules, the damage would be to the sacral segments of the spinal cord. Accurately predicting the level of a spinal cord lesion is of critical importance in developing a rehabilitation program or prescribing assistive devices for a patient after a spinal injury, as we will see a little later in the session. This is because of topographical organization of the spinal nerve distribution. Simply put, a set of neurons will take the most direct spinal nerve to reach their target organ. Again, this concept can be applied to our roadway analogy. Whenever you head for a specific destination off of a highway, you typically choose the exit closest to your destination. This concept is most clearly illustrated when looking at dermatome maps of the body. The sensory nerves from the skin that pick up general sensation, pressure, touch, and pain, follow this topographical arrangement, generating clearly defined and predictable horizontal stripes of sensation from a single spinal nerve. C7, for example, runs down the posterior aspect of the arm into the index and middle fingers. The nipple line is generally supplied by T4 and the navel by T10. This relationship is not perfect. A lesion to a single spinal nerve may not necessarily result in much sensation loss due to significant overlap of one dermatone with those immediately superior and inferior to it. The relationship does still hold, however, as evident by skin conditions such as shingles. Shingles are the result of a latent herpes zoster infection, the same virus responsible for causing chickenpox in small children. Once the infection is first suppressed in adolescence, much of the virus ends up laying dormant in the sensory cell bodies found in the dorsal root ganglia we discussed earlier. In some instances, typically associated with a compromised immune system, the virus within a single ganglion becomes reactivated, generating viral particles that extend the length of the individual neurons, resulting in painful rash and blisters to the skin supplied by the affected nerve. Anyone who has ever had chickenpox can develop shingles at a later time. Note that due to the predictability of dermatomal distribution, we can predict with reasonable accuracy the precise cord level of an infection. In the upper figure, the blisters follow a dermatome superior to the umbilicus. As the umbilicus is supplied by T10, this is most likely a T7 or T8 spinal nerve condition. The lower figure demonstrates a C7 or C8 spinal nerve infection. Having now looked at the different components of the spinal cord and spinal nerves, we can now consider the most simplistic of neural circuits, the stretch reflex. Ever had a doctor's appointment where the doctor tapped a number of your tendons with a small rubber hammer? The doctor was testing what's known as the stretch reflex. A highly specialized sensory fiber senses rapid lengthening of a muscle as initiated with the tendon tap and sends a signal back to the spinal cord. This is an example of proprioception, which we discussed previously. In addition to sending a message on the movement back to the brain, the sensory fibers directly synapse on motor neurons supplying the same muscle, stimulating them to generate a muscle contraction. Another group of fibers synapse upon an inhibitory interneuron in the spinal cord, which suppresses contractions in the antagonistic muscles that try to oppose this contraction, improving the effectiveness of the contraction. Note the location of the cell bodies and projections for both the motor neurons and interneurons in the gray matter, which we described earlier when looking at the cross-section of a spinal cord. Reflexes are not under volitional control, as the loops bypass the volitional control centers of the brain. It's designed to provide immediate protective muscle contractions in response to rapid muscle stretches, as are often seen during a loss of balance, such as occurs when slipping on ice, for example. So why do physicians go through the trouble of testing the reflex arcs? Is it a sadistic pleasure they get in hammering on people's tendons? Well, maybe, but there's a little more to it than that. The motor neurons follow a very similar topography as the sensory neurons. A given muscle or a group of muscles receive the motor innervation from very specific spinal cord levels. 
I mean, think about it. It doesn't make much sense for a nerve to branch from the cervical region and travel with minimal protection down to the torso to reach the leg, right? As a result, we can map the activation of certain muscle groups to specific nerve branches in the body in a similar fashion to how we mapped dermatomes. In the case of muscle testing, we call these myotomes. This can provide a great deal of information regarding the site of neural lesions. A loss of voluntary contractile strength in an individual muscle group may result from a spinal cord lesion supplying the muscle or a peripheral nerve lesion due to compression or laceration of a specific nerve. Reflex testing helps us distinguish between the two. If a peripheral nerve is damaged, then no neural activity is able to leave or enter the nerve and, not surprisingly, the reflex is completely absent. What may come as a surprise, however, is that we tend to observe hyperreflexia, or clonus, in regions below a spinal cord injury. Now, a minute ago, we described the reflex arc, but we didn't mention that higher order neurons that project from the brain have a suppressive effect on reflexes. They tend to downregulate the magnitude of a reflex. You can think of reflexes as being like out of control six year olds, and the higher order neurons as being like their parents, warning them to behave themselves. So, what happens following a spinal cord injury? Again, using our highway analogy, if there is a major accident across all lanes of a highway, then nothing is getting through past the site of the accident. Notice, however, that vehicles can still access roads that are found before the accident. So reflexes above the level of damage are fine and uninvolved. If we look very specifically at the level of damage, we would expect direct damage to the motor neurons within this region of the spinal cord, and so we would expect paralysis as well as a loss of reflexes. But look at the peculiar example below the level of spinal cord damage. Here, we lose all input from higher order centers, which means a loss of voluntary movement, as well as higher order control over reflex activity. But notice that the reflex arcs in this region would not be damaged. The effect is like leaving a group of six-year-olds alone with no supervision. They just get out of control. As a result, we absorb these exaggerated reflex arcs. In the case of clonus, shown here, reflexive contraction in one muscle group triggers a stretch reflex in the opposing or antagonistic muscle group, which also contracts. This, once again, triggers a contraction in the first group, which once again contracts, generating a repetitive cycle and tremor between the muscle groups. As mentioned previously, accurately predicting the level of spinal cord lesion is of critical importance in developing a rehabilitation program following a spinal cord injury. We can now see why. All function below the site of the lesion will be obliterated with a cord lesion, whereas all function superior to the site of the lesion will be spared. Because of the segmentation of the spinal cord and topographical organization of the spinal nerves, trained healthcare providers will be able to use their knowledge of myotomes to accurately predict the capabilities and limitations of the individual patient during the rehabilitation process. Here we see a simplistic myotome chart describing actions assigned to different cord levels. Let's say we had a cord lesion at the level of C8. Applying this information to our chart, functions highlighted in red would no longer be possible, while functions highlighted in green would be preserved. This would be a case of incomplete quadriplegia, where general arm movements would be spared, but intrinsic hand function would be lost. These charts can become quite complex. If you're the type of student that likes referring to textbooks, I strongly recommend Physical Rehabilitation by O'Sullivan. It has elaborate charts that provide thorough detail for each level of cord injury. For the PTs, it outlines available movements and activities that patients can be expected to perform independently. For the OTs, it also suggests the assistive equipment required to modify certain tasks and improve ADLs. Certainly not something you need for the present course, just be aware of its existence for future reference. That's it for our discussion of the spinal cord itself. In the third and final session, we'll be looking at the protective coverings of the spinal cord, namely the meninges. See you after the break.